this is really uh, an area that interests me uh, almost the most. It's manipulation. It's manipulation of physical space um, and of systems that I understand a little better. It's making and tinkering and uh, trying to squeeze everything out of what you have. I'm Esther Emery of Fauchomatic Off-Grid. We're here at Wheaton Labs on day 11 of our first ever permaculture design course. You're hearing from me today because Nick is asleep. Okay, just kidding, he isn't really asleep. He did take a nap, but it was a very short nap. And he is excited to tell you about our day 11, which was focused on appropriate technology. Today, we addressed appropriate technology. Now, after this two weeks of the permaculture design course, there's another two weeks, which is entirely uh, appropriate technology. Um, we are not attending that part. I kind of wish I was because um, it's my thing. It's the building philosophy. It's the it's the devices. It's the um, it's the tech. It's the the stuff that makes it work. The lineage of our term appropriate technology comes from E. F. Schumacher, the economist, and his book Small is Beautiful, which is one of the my top five recommended reads for people who are interested in alternative lifestyles, meaningful living, homesteading, small scale living, simpler life, any of those buzzwords. Uh, e. F. Schumacher Small is beautiful. He had an idea of appropriate technology. I think he might have used a different term for it and then it's been transitioned or understood differently by different people since the 70s, um, which is when Small is Beautiful was written. And now in permaculture is understood as appropriate technology. And there are a few different criteria for what defines that, but it's small scale, locally sourced, and repeatable. All technology is context dependent. It depends. So same technology in a different area may not be appropriate. So it's context dependent. Um, it has to be small scale, local, easily replicable. Um, the other thing is that there are broad categories and they are solar thermal, combustion, biological, and that means technology is based around say, biosand filtration, compost piles, those sorts of things, electrical, and uh, human powered. So they're the broad categories that I tend to use as a lens to look at design. Erica and Ernie Wisner were the guest instructors for appropriate technology, but our main instructor, Tim Barker, for the entire PDC, appropriate technology is also his wheelhouse. So today we had all three instru instructors kind of going for it, and uh, Tim in particular just kind of had, had his rocket shoes on coming on to the end of the, the course and wanting to give us as much information as possible. He was just sketching like mad, giving us ideas and projects um, to be able to take home to be able to uh, apply to our own lives wherever we may go. But you have a container like this. What happens is the container will then suddenly it'll overbalance one way, it just goes tip and it will dump a heap of water in a pulse. And because then the arrangement of the pivot and look at them online before you try and design one, but it will then flop back into place. So it will reset itself. So it just, it'll top up and then it just goes bang dumps everything in a pulse and then gravity makes it pop back in, into place. One thing that falls into the area of appropriate technology uh, is house design uh, or just um, shelter design we might say. Um, so we went over the basics of passive solar design which I was somewhat familiar with but uh, you know it's one of those things that you can kind of dabble in and take some ideas from but you're not really executing it unless you look at all of the criteria within passive solar design. So here you can see that the high sun angle actually has a very small width of sunbeam that's allowed in. Sunbeams tend to be all a whole bunch of parallel light. It doesn't look that way for, from perspective, but it, it, they really do come in fairly parallel, fairly predictable angle. And so at noon in the summer, summer solstice, you're really only making a foot wide sun patch. And you can see where if you brought that eave out a couple of feet, you could block that entirely if you wanted to. It's a little much for me to be able to regurgitate on the spot, but it involves uh, carefully siting your house, 
and building it in such a way that it is able to use the power of the sun, uh, warmth and light and, and its energy to both um, keep your house warm in the winter, it can keep your house cooler in the summer, tying surfaces to the earth uh, in order to get a, uh, a constant temperature. The earth is one of the most temperature stable things there is. So if you're able to tie your living space into the earth, you're gonna spend a lot less energy heating and cooling and riding those hills and valleys uh, of the temperature spectrum, especially where we live, where there's such a wide temperature swing day to day and season to season. So passive solar design um, is a key part of uh, sort of using less energy and be, you know, designing smarter uh, in order to uh, not work so hard. Everything we do with Solar Passive is a moving on that theme. So this, that's a solar oven. If we increase the insulation and make lots of surface area and double glaze. It's a solar food dryer if we have big collection area but we also add airflow. It's a solar hot water system if we add partially insulate and we add a coil of water. We also took another look at composting toilets and talked about why you would do it and uh, a couple of different ways how. Um, we've already talked a lot in the class about um, you know successes and failures of different systems, reasons uh, you know and a lot of those failures are reasons why people don't think it's a good idea uh, on a on a big scale. So we looked at a couple different systems, including a two-chamber system, uh, which really reduces the amount of handling that you have to do of any material, which is really an attractive option for me, and we actually have the possibility of incorporating that back into our house design. Uh, we looked at uh, the bucket system, and we looked at uh, a couple other different ways of doing it, but it's yet another thing that people can do that uses less energy and sort of closes the nutrient loop. We also looked at, you know, little things like the, uh, if you are gonna use a, a septic or a flush toilet, that you'd be able to get two, at least two uses out of the water that you're using for that by doing one of the tank top sinks, uh, the sink that goes right into your toilet tank. Um, so, it's little things like that, working around the margins of efficiency to, uh, to make things easier and use less uh, resources. And of course, Ernie and Erica uh, talked about fire. Uh, they've worked very hard to improve uh, the use of wood as fuel. Um, so we looked at uh, a couple different uses of that, talked about the efficiency of uh, rocket mass heaters and uh, other uses of thermal mass as well. Speaking of experts, um, Tim Barker, the uh, the instructor for this course, uh, has an ebook out, uh, which is an instructional uh, book on how to build a rocket-fired oven. Uh, and we've used one here at the lab, helping to cook dinner and, and do different things. Uh, it works really well. It's crazy how fast this oven heats up with this much wood. He's written it in such a way that um, it, even if you don't have welding equipment, if you have just sort of a bare bones tool set, you're able to get this thing working and really benefit from you know, his work and other people's work that has gone into sort of innovating this, uh, this rocket technology. So it's these types of projects that are really worth taking a look at. If you're interested in uh, using less fuel um, and doing something for yourself, uh, this line of appropriate tech is um, it's something that you should be studying. My, my takeaway from a lot of this is that Electricity is wonderful and great, but only use it for those things that you cannot replace it with. So, um, you know, computers, they need electricity to run. So that's fine. You're not going to replace that with a combustion technology unless you're using heat energy to make electrical energy. So 
by, by reducing our needs on complex systems, then we make ourselves more resilient. Their kids made some bird nests to go with the paper birds that Stuart has been making for them. They used clay and sand, just like the way we make cob. These are bird nests that we made out of mud and... Well, Sadie had grass and straw, and I have these seeds that come off of a kind of grass. I also... They make it nice and fuzzy and easier for my birdie. This bird likes being held. Does she? Yeah. And that's why I'm holding her with her in her nest. Uh, so designs uh, for the culmination of the class are well underway. We only have a few more days to get our materials together and then we'll present to the class. Now is the time where things are getting down on paper. We're making some decisions and then uh, chasing out all the details around them. We've spent time out on the land. Every once in a while we have a question about what something looks like. We run back up to the land and try and figure it out. And, uh, and things are really happening. It was our hottest day yet today and the kids are pretty near rebellion. The pressure's on Nick to be able to make it through and make the most of this course in the last couple of days remaining here while his family is, is really ready to go on to the next thing. So everybody send good cheers to Nick and encouragement that he can do it and we'll do our best to see it through. All right, well I'm Nick from Fouchmatic Off Grid. Come on back for day 12 of the PDC here at Wheaton Labs and see how we pull this thing off. birdies and little nestsies. If we get higher, we'll get to Brandon's. And if we get even higher, we'll get to mine.